Okay, so we are now live on, on YouTube, so I'm going to start webinar. Perfect. We are live and ready to go. So hello, everyone. I see we have a few participants joining us, and I'm sure many more will slowly um, stream in here as we get going. Um, welcome. My name is Ali. I will be your host and moderator for this webinar. This is a webinar in the series that the Marine Diaries is producing, and this webinar is Fisheries, Solutions, and Innovations. So I hope you are as excited as I am to learn from our expert panel about kind of different techniques and what's out there in terms of fisheries. Um, throughout this webinar, we will be asking our panel a series of different questions. If you also have questions that you would like to follow up on, please put your questions in the Q&A box or the chat box, and we'll try to answer them as we go through the webinar or we'll loop back to them at the end. I would now like to pass it off to Rebecca Daniel, our director here at the Marine Diaries. Hi everyone, and welcome to this webinar on fisheries. Um, so I am Rebecca Daniel, and I am the director of the Marine Diaries. Uh, we felt we needed to kind of cover this topic um, after the release of Conspiracy. Um, obviously, it covered um, a lot of different issues in. Um, sorry, one second. <laughs> Um, a lot of different issues in the fisheries um, industry, but it, it's been and it's been fantastic in starting a conversation around fisheries, um, but it definitely doesn't hold all of the answers. Um, yes, eating less fish is a really good start um, for the, uh, those of us in a privileged position to do so, but it's not the whole story. So today, like Ali said, we're going to be hearing from some various organizations around the world who are working to make fish um, a more sustainable choice for um, eating. Um, and we hope that we can show you that there are other solutions out there. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Um, it's gonna be a really, really fantastic discussion. Um, we hope you find it use useful. Um, and I will hand back to Ali. Thank you, Rebecca. So on our panel, we have Rachel from Oceanwise Seafoods, Jerry from Aqua Farms Organization, and Craig, from International Pull and Line Foundation. I'd like to first pass it off to Rachel if you'd like to introduce yourself and your organization. Yeah, absolutely. So hi everyone, my name is Rachel Chudno and I uh, work for the Oceanwise Seafood Team, which is part of a not-for-profit conservation organization based in Canada, the Oceanwise Conservation Association. Um, Myself, I have uh, over 10 years experience working in fishery science in Atlantic, Pacific and inland fisheries in Canada. Um, I've done work both with the federal government agency here in Canada, uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, which manages commercial fisheries, as well as the provincial government in the province of British Columbia. Um, I'm also working to wrap up the last few months of a PhD dissertation uh, in quantitative fishery science. So actually doing um, mathematical modeling and what's called a formal uh, risk assessment or a decision analysis to try to quantify uncertainty about how dynamic and changing fisheries are and how people respond to changes in a resource to try to build management that's really robust to all those uncertainties that we have when we talk about fishery science. Um, I represent, like I said, OceanWise. We are a seafood ratings program that's uh, been around for about 16 years, while our conservation organization has been around for over 65 years now. And the seafood program grew from uh, a project between a couple of local chefs with 16 local restaurants in BC, British Columbia, that wanted to promote sustainable seafood to what's now uh, an international sustainable seafood program with just under 700 partners covering almost 3,000 business locations in 11 countries worldwide to help people find and understand what it means to be sustainable for seafood. Thank you, Rachel. I can't wait to hear more from you. Jerry, would you like to introduce yourself and Aqua Farms organization? Yes, thank you so much. Um, my name is Jerry Mangena from Tanzania. I'm a marine biologist by profession but also an aquapreneur. I practice uh, fish farming as a business, but fish farming as a social entrepreneurship. Um, I'm a trained also uh, aquaculturist from the University of Dar es Salaam with four years of experience um, in Sub-Saharan African aquaculture. 
Um, I've been practicing issues around fish farming, especially tilapia in Tanzania for some time now, helping farmers to um, address challenges that they're facing, but also um, bringing economic competitive but sustainable way of, of farming. Um, apart from that, I work with the University of Dar es Salaam through the School of Aquatic Sciences and Fisheries as a tutor in issues on aquatic genetics, where I assist students in uh, tutorials and practicals on um, aquatic genetics and research. Um, beyond that, from a social uh, perspective, I'm a Mandela Washington Fellow, a global shaper, but also um, organization. It's a non-government organization based in Tanzania. Um, we are working on sustainable utilization of aquatic resources and this means um, lakes, rivers and the ocean. Our work is centered on, on fisheries, aquaculture as well as uh, coastal community health as we believe that integration of livelihood approaches in, in, up, in everything that we do is of the environment and the resources itself, meaning the ocean, the lakes, and the rivers. Over the past years, we've been able to do a couple of things um, around aquaculture specifically, which is training a number of people, uh, more than 2,000 actually, on economic and sustainable uh, competitive aquaculture. And that way it has been the best way into which people are getting into a knowledgeable and well environmental um, conscious aquaculture practices. Um, that's it about aquafarms and about me, and I'm happy to be a part of this webinar today. I hope everyone enjoys the discussion. Perfect. Thank you, Jerry. Can't wait to hear more about uh, aquafarms and everything about the tilapia and aquaculture industry. I would now like to pass it off to Craig, if you would like to introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Craig Turley, and I'm the Fisheries Improvement Manager at the International Pole and Line Foundation, or IPNLF. So uh, IPNLF uh, only supports low impact, one by one fishing methods, which use one hook and one line to catch one tuna at a time. These are considered the most environmentally and socially responsible forms of fishing. So some of you watching may have watched Seaspiracy and are questioning whether such a thing as sustainable seafood exists. Uh, in my opinion, Seaspiracy did a great job of bringing some of the issues in fisheries into the public consciousness. But Seaspiracy uh, entirely focused on industrial fishing methods, and rightly so, because these are some of the most damaging and profit-driven activities that are degrading our oceans. However, the filmmakers, uh, missed the opportunity to show the flip side of, of the coin. Uh, these are the small scale fishers that depend on fishing for their livelihood and harvest their coastal waters with low impact methods uh, that they've been using for millennia and have worked in balance with nature. So over the course of this webinar, I'm hoping to tell you more about these fisheries uh, how IPNLF support them and uh, what you guys can do to support them as well. So thank you. Thank you, Craig. Can't wait to uh, grill you more about that coming up. Um, I would like to start off with, we'll ask, start by asking um, Rachel from Oceanwise Seafood her questions. But as a reminder to the audience, um, if you have any questions for our panelists at any time during the webinar, please ask your questions in the Q&A box or the chat box. And uh, we'd love to try to answer them and get them up to the uh, panelists so they can answer them as well. All right, Rachel, starting it off, could you briefly explain the issues with wild caught fisheries and how ocean wise seafood is tackling this through the promotion of sustainable seafood? question. Um, seafood sustainability, as we all know, is critically important for many reasons. And globally, fisheries and aquaculture and those that depend on aquatic resources is massive. Um, worldwide fisheries and aquaculture production is nearly 180 million tons annually. And though a proportion of that does come from, you know, highly unsustainable industrial fisheries, there is a lot of that production that's coming from small scale 
uh, coastal communities that are fishing for their livelihood and to put food on their table. So um, food production through fisheries supports food security. And in fact, over 3 billion people worldwide rely on seafood as an important source of protein and essential nutrients. And as well, um, the global organization that creates these estimates, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, um, has stated recently that fisheries and aquaculture actually support the livelihoods directly of 10 to 12% of the world's population. So that's a lot of people that don't have the option to, to stop eating seafood or to stop you know, purchasing um, or, or creating uh, seafood for us to eat. Um, that said, the scale and impacts of overfishing are massive. And as Craig mentioned, like the, the sea spiracy did bring to the table a lot of the issues that currently threaten our world's oceans regarding industrial scale overfishing. Um, and overfishing does contribute substantially to biodiversity loss, habitat destruction, um, and bycatch of marine species. And uh, the FAO also recognizes that one third of the world's oceans uh, are, fish stocks rather, are currently overfished. Um, that said, uh, choosing sustainable seafood, um, like following a program like OceanWise helps you ensure that you're not contributing to overfishing and instead you're driving market pressure to those types of fisheries that Craig was talking about, where you're supporting more sustainable, environmentally uh, sustainable options and well-managed fisheries and aquaculture operations that are supporting the livelihoods of people in your communities and people in communities worldwide. So really quickly, just about what OceanWise is doing. Um, Global certi certifications and rating programs like OceanWise try to assess seafood to determine its ecological sustainability so that you can determine if what you're purchasing is a sustainable choice or if it's something you should stay away from. Um, that said, the types of assessments we write only cover 30% of the world's fisheries and aquaculture at present. So we're working really hard to try to fill those gaps. And I'll, I'll talk a bit later on when we talk about international organizations and who else is doing this type of work. Um, the other really, really quick point is that uh, there are two different types of programs that do seafood recommendations. Um, one is a ratings program like OceanWise. Another is an eco certification. There are a lot of them out there. Marine Stewardship Council, Aquaculture Stewardship Council. Um, they both play complementary roles in, in driving sustainable change in fisheries and aquaculture, but they are different in the way that they work and in what they assess. Um, and if people have questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to touch on that. So. OceanWise is an organization um, works to, uh, to be a trusted source of information for industry and consumers to interpret uh, science behind our changing environment to know what seafood is sustainable to eat. And we do that by conducting science to uh, develop recommendations by assessing fisheries and aquaculture. And then we partner with uh, businesses throughout the seafood supply chain from producers to major suppliers, to restaurants, uh, to chefs to help those businesses identify and preferentially source more sustainable seafood options, um, as well as to support consumers in being able to make educated choices, either at a fish counter or when they're in the grocery store. So um, sorry, that was a little long-winded, but there's, there's a lot to cover there. Happy to, to answer any questions, like I said, afterwards. Great, thank you, uh, Rachel. Yeah, so much information there to unpack, um, but yeah, you're totally right within there's just so many people relying on seafood and there's sustainable ways to definitely choose that seafood. So when I go to my grocery store and I look at a sea, like a piece of seafood and I see the ocean wise symbol on it, what does this mean about the product I'm buying and how was this specific seafood company chosen to have an ocean wise symbol on it? Yeah, for sure. So the OceanWise Seafood Symbol is basically our easy way for consumers and businesses to, to identify that uh, whatever that seafood is in that package or in that fish catcher meets our program's assurance that it's a seafood that's an ocean-friendly choice. And basically that symbol identifies that that seafood product meets requirements to be OceanWise recommended um, as a sustainable option, meaning that it is ensuring the long-term health and abundance of the species that's being targeted by fishing. So if it were a, a, a cod fly, it means that that population of cod is, you know, uh, at a half healthy population size, that it's coming from fisheries or from aquaculture facilities or farms that are effectively and adaptively managed. As we know, um, fisheries and the ocean is an incredibly dynamic and changing place. And management needs to be one, be effective, but two, needs to be able to, you know, 
to um, to react to those changes to protect the stock and to protect those participating within uh, that fishery so that they can continue to enjoy access to that fishery over the long term. Um, it also is a fishery or, or aquaculture facility that is working to minimize its impacts both on the surrounding environment uh, as including the aquatic ecosystems where those fish or seafood are found so that they can continue to support life into the future. It also means that uh, a member of our staff has confirmed the sourcing and logo usage. The oceanwide symbol can only be used by official partners of our program who have approved local uh, logo usage. And then the, the last piece there, uh, partners aren't actually chosen. Instead, people see the value of our program and join mostly by word of mouth, particularly in Canada, where we're a fairly well-recognized brand. We have about 30% market penetration. Um, so we generally find businesses proactively seek us out and shoot us an email because they see the value of our program. Um, in that we provide like really detailed customized support um, to partners. We train their staff in what seafood sustainability is and how to communicate that to uh, their customers. And we also help them develop market connections through the supply chain to help them access sustainable seafood options through different producers and suppliers that we work at. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so they really they really choose you and seek you out then, which is very interesting, kind of a great way to do it if they know their product and know that it's sustainable. That's great. Um, I guess you kind of touched on this as well then in that answer. So one of your four criteria, I guess, for OceanWise, the OceanWise Seafood Seal of Approval is like a well-managed um, kind of fishery or fish stock. What exactly is like a well-managed fishery or fish stock? Um, in kind of like layman's terms, if I looked at a fish stock, how would I know that this is well managed? Yeah, for sure. So when OceanWise scores the sustainability of a fishery, we actually use um, like numeric scoring to, to, to score different attributes. And we use a formal framework called a standard, which is a peer reviewed like written document that we use. We look at a fishery and different attributes of the data. We compare it to what the standard says meets a certain threshold and then we score it that way. Um, broadly, to be considered well-managed, a fishery has some really key attributes. The first is that it has strong investment in data collection, which it can be used to inform scientific assessment, both through scientific surveys, which are occurring external to the fishery, so very uh, scientific in their approach um, and separate from the fishery, as well as uh, data coming from the fishery or the farm itself. Um, this data collection implies not only that the management is effectively accounting for the impact uh, of that fishery on the targeted species, so what they're fishing for, but is also working to mitigate impacts on other species as well as the greater environment. Um, as well, well-managed fisheries use that best available scientific advice as well as, and this is super important, um, consultation with rights holders and with stakeholders that are engaged within the fishery uh, to develop a management process and to develop management measures so that those that are active participants within that fishery have a voice in the management. And that's really important for ensuring that that management has uptake and that not only it's enforceable, but that folks are going to follow the regulations that are put in place because they're bought into that process. Um, the last piece which kind of goes without saying, but it's often something we don't think about, is that it has to be a fishery that is able to successfully enforce its regulations that's put in place to ensure that they're followed. Because as we all know, like it doesn't matter how good your role is, if, if people aren't following it, then that's not going to be effective in meeting its objectives. Um, it's important to note as well is that when data is not available to determine any of these factors or to determine any of the other factors that are important to OceanWise and determining recommendation, what we end up doing is taking a precautionary approach as is defined within that written standard. And what happens is the score for that fishery sustainability goes down. So lack of data means that uh, your score goes down and that uh, helps us ensure that we're not missing something when we're developing those recommendations. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, so a lot of self-governments, which I guess kind of makes sense. If you can kind of help regulate your own fisheries, then it will be manageable because not everyone can always oversee it. Um, very interesting. I guess kind of the last question to sum it up is a lot of our audience is not within Canada. So what's the future for ocean-wise seafood? Are you planning on expanding your campaign internationally and not just in Canada? Or what other kind of qualities or certifications could our global audience look for when uh, buying seafood? 
Yeah, absolutely. So for um, our markets program, which is that logo program for sustainable seafood, um, we uh, have grown from our foundations in Canada over the past 16 years, and we do already have a bit of an international presence through partnerships, primarily with seafood producers and some suppliers in 11 countries. Uh, and I'll, I'll provide a link to you. People can check out where all of our partners are located around the globe um, using a partner map on our website. So they can have a look and if particularly if they're in uh, US Canada, they can see what partners may be near to them. Um, and we're really excited to be continue to grow that international impact. Um, that said, OceanWise is also a proud member of a organization called the Global Seafoods Rating Alliance. Um, and the Global Seafood Rating Alliance is a collaboration between 13 global seafood rating organizations across six continents. So every continent excluding Antarctica. And even though each of these programs uh, present ourselves differently through the use of different logos, we're all working towards the same goals on the water of improving the effectiveness and efficiency of seafood ratings and to standardize the way that we assess sustainable seafood at a global scale to make it easy for people wherever you are on the globe to be able to find out what is uh, like an ocean friendly choice near you. Um, I'll provide you a link to the GSRA website as well. I think that's probably the best way for, for folks to find out which rating organization is closest to them. Um, they all have amazing resources, be it uh, little guides you can print off to take to the grocery store to help you um, choose sustainable seafood um, or recipes as well to help you, you know, maybe broaden your horizons and try something that might be a more sustainable option than something you're currently buying. Um, also, just to, to wrap up, OceanWise has uh, a couple of new conservation initiatives that we're also looking, you know, to broad our, our uh, experience in Canada as well as internationally. Um, one of these is a really neat project that just has kicked off in the past few weeks within the Canadian Arctic. Um, and that is um, dealing with small scale fisheries here in Canada. So historically, one of the main limitations to large scale ratings and certification programs like ourselves, like MSC, like Aquaculture Stewardship Council, all of us, uh, is that small scale fisheries have not been able to access the benefits of those ratings and certification schemes because we have such high data requirements. So as I said, when we were talking about management, if you don't have information about dam management, your score goes down. It's the same for everything, be it uh, the impacts of fishing on the species being harvested, impacts on the environment, impacts on other species. So we're actually going to be working in the uh, in collaboration in the Canadian Arctic um, with local Inuit fishing communities, as well as Inuit youth uh, to co-develop a new way of assessing northern communities, taking uh, into account the, the Western science perspective that OceanWise and other ratings and certification bodies have traditionally used uh, and other ways of knowing and understanding the world around us and being able to, uh, to work together towards a future that it incorporates everybody's understanding of the world. Perfect, thank you, Isha. That was a great summary to kind of um, finish it up. I'm just gonna ask you one question that we got from um, the audience before we pass it along. Um, this is from Charlene Roberts, and I'm hoping you have an answer to this um, as well, or can give your best um, knowledge on it at least. So Charlene asked, I noticed that you recommend many MSC certified fisheries as sustainable choices, although they have come in um, a lot of criticism for the types of fisheries that they certify. For instance, Many tuna fisheries use uh, drifting fish aggregating devices, FADSs, are certified as sustainable by the, M by the MSC, despite there being lots of evidence that they are destructive gear that causes a lot of damage to marine ecosystems and contribute hugely to marine plastic pollution. Does OceanWise promote tuna per se net fisheries using FADs as a sustainable choice to consumers? Yeah, I do have it. I definitely have an answer to that. So um, <laughs> we have essentially a hard and fast rule on the OceanWise Science staff that we never disregard or don't recommend, not across the board, we don't recommend any destructive fishing practices like, uh, like um, 
uh, shoot, sorry, I've lost my mind for a second. Um, like you can use explosive devices to blow up the water and that kills all the fish and kind of indiscriminately kills everything. So destructive fishing like that, OceanWise across the board does not recommend. But for the, the pretty much the rest of the ways that you can catch a fish or a seafood on earth, OceanWise doesn't have a hard and fast rule that we don't recommend it. And that's because the world is a very big place and the way that people interact with marine resources across the globe very significantly, even within one harvest method. Uh, and for that reason, you can't usually across the board say that something is bad. That said, we we totally agree that there are harmful fishing methods out there. FADS is definitely one of them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, OceanWise uses that standard to score the sustainability of fisheries. There was actually some really amazing benchmarking work that was done by colleagues of ours in the States. And what they did is they took the way that the Eco Certification MSC certifies fisheries and compared that standard to the standard OceanWise uses uh, and looked at what the average score for an MSC fishery was. And that's actually below the, the threshold to be OceanWise. So OceanWise does defer to some MSC, but they have to meet a bunch of set decision roles that we have um, about their impacts, particularly on other species, because impacts on other species aside from the target stock were, were something that were identified as being an issue. Um, and for that reason, 99.9% .9 of FADs are not recommended. And that is because when you put a FAD in the water, it works by, you know, fish and other animals see it and they're like, oh, wow, open ocean, there's cover, I can hide under here. This is great. And they all go underneath it. And then if you put your persane around that fad, you'll catch everything that's aggregated, um, which often leads to fisheries impacts on non-target species, particularly um, other, if it's a tuna, other tunas you're not trying to catch, juvenile tunas that haven't had a chance to have um, offspring yet that can contribute to the population, um, as well as other species. So for that reason, almost all fads are not recommended. But again, across the board, we don't discount fishing methods because there are very rare ways that you can use a fad sustainably if you're very careful about what you're picking up and you pick up your fad when you're done. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Rachel. I actually did not know too much about fads as considering I called them FADSs. Um, so thank you so much for all that information. That was great and so much information from you. Um, audience, if you have any other questions for Rachel, please put them in the chat or the Q&A box and we'll hopefully be able to link back to her to ask her some more questions towards the end, towards the end of the webinar. So thank you, Rachel. All right, my next um, panelist that I would like to bring up and ask some questions to will be Craig from International Pull and Line Foundation. Craig, could you briefly explain the issue with most wild commercial fishery techniques, such as purse seine nets, trawling, long lines, et cetera, and how the International Pull and Line Foundation tackles these to contribute to fisheries sustainability? Yeah, sure. Uh, so thanks for the question. So I'd like to start by saying, um, you know, all fishing methods have some impact on the ocean, given that fishing by its very nature is extractive. Um, but the impacts of industrial fisheries and some artisanal fisheries like gill nets are disproportionate to their benefits. The main problem with industrial scale fisheries is their capacity to overfish, compounded by their non-selectivity resulting in bycatch and their broader ecosystem impacts in the form of habitat destruction and plastic pollution, which is all driven by fleet overcapacity and overcapitalization through um, harmful subsidies, which means that actually um, we're paying for ocean destruction with our taxpayers' money. So to give some quick examples, um, per seine fisheries that fish on uh, fish aggregation devices or FADs, as uh, Rachel just mentioned, they can catch on average 20 to 50 tons of tuna per set. And they take out the whole school when they encircle the set. And that includes juvenile fish, which compounds the effects of overfishing and all the associated species, including sharks, turtles, cetaceans. Industrial long lines, uh, they can deploy over 50 kilometers of mainline with over 10,000 hooks on. And personally, my least favorite of all, drifting gill nets, 
They can span 20 kilometers in length and passively drift through the water column, catching and killing everything that happens to swim in its path. So when any of these gears are lost or abandoned, uh, as is routine with fads in the purse seine industry, they can continue to fish in a process known as ghost fishing, where they entangle and ensnare marine life with absolutely no benefit to humans for potentially centuries to come with little or no oversight from governments or management authorities. So all of this kind of adds to the ability of industrial fisheries to undermine the sovereignty of coastal states and their resources, um, undermine the livelihoods of coastal fishers who are then outcompeted when their waters are overfished and the markets are flooded with cheap, uh, huge quantities of cheap seafood um, and also their access to fishing rights is restricted in favor of commercial or industrial licenses. So for the second part of the question, how does IPNLF uh, tackle this to contribute to ocean sustainability? Well, firstly, we only support low impact one by one fishing methods. We work from the fisheries level in management and quality control, uh, as well as with joint conservation projects. We work at the policy level uh, with regional fisheries management organizations and national governments, helping to secure the rights of um, the rights and access for small scale fishers. Uh, and we also ensure that the consumer has access to this tuna uh, through our, our industry membership. So we have members that span processors, retailers, and international brands. And they're all committed to sourcing one by one tuna from these small scale fisheries. Uh, and finally, we promote this responsible tuna direct to consumer through our Instagram channels um, or, or all our social media channels, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, through webinars like this. Uh, and also our new platform that's launching next month called the Sourcing Transparency Platform, which will be uh, a, a place that consumers can go to to see where their tuna is coming from and um, double check those claims and see how companies are working towards a better, better sustainability or lowering their impacts, I should say. Great, okay, so yeah, lots of, lots of things that the International Full and Line Foundation does then to support kind of um, low impact fisheries. So you mentioned that you have low impact one by one fishing. So this includes things as trolling, hand in line, pole in line fishing. Um, would you be able to explain the difference between these fisheries techniques and how these strategies differ from big commercial fleets? Yeah, sure. Uh, I love this one. Um, so pole and line is really as simple as it sounds. It's a bamboo or fiberglass pole with a short section of monofil monofilament fishing line attached uh, and a barbless hook on the end. So when a fisher finds a, or, or, or when a skipper finds a school of fish, they start chumming the waters in order to um, uh, chumming, baiting the waters in order to um, invoke a feeding frenzy in the school of tuna. And they turn on sprayers, which spray water over the surface of the uh, over the surface of the water to mask the, the silhouette of the vessel. And then basically they dip the hook into the water, either baited with a small lure or sometimes completely unbaited. And because the fish are in the feeding frenzy, they come up, they, they snatch the hook. And then for small fish, the fisherman can lift it directly over their head and the fish will drop off because it's a barbless hook. Or for larger fish, they have to pull the, the bamboo pole to the side of the boat and, and pull the fish in board, on board that way. Um, Hand line is also as simple as it sounds. Uh, it's a long um, monofilament line, sometimes attached to a braided main line with one hook attached. And this technique is usually large, um, used to target larger fish, um, larger yellowfin tuna, um, deeper, deeper big eye tuna. And once the tuna is hooked, the fisherman needs to pull him on board with just the line. It really is no mean feat, and it's one of the more impressive ways uh, to catch a fish, that's for sure. 
And finally, trolling, not to be confused with trawling. So it's T-R-O-L-L-I-N-G, trolling. So trolling is the, the process of towing an artificial lure behind a boat in order to entice a strike from a passing fish. And this is kind of a way to find out where the fish are, and um, it can be conducted using hand line or rod and reel. So these methods are different from other commercial fishing uh, techniques that we previously mentioned because they're highly selective. They're catching one fish at a time with minimal bycatch or interactions with sens sensitive marine habitats like coral reefs or uh, mangroves. And there's no destructive marine ecosystem impacts through the loss or uh, loss of abandonment of fishing gear. Um, they're also extremely employment rich and they contribute to uh, coastal communities food security. Um, so some of you are probably asking the question like how can this technique be commercially vi viable you know like how can they catch enough tuna one by one. But actually these methods are incredibly effective uh, and in the Maldives alone they catch 60 to 100,000 tons of tuna a year using the Poland line method um, and that's just 12 to 15% of the catch, uh, tuna catch for the Indian Ocean. And that's all with minimal bycatch or habitat degradation. And it's on all on locally owned vessels that support the livelihoods of thousands of Maldivians. Uh, it's also just worth noting here that, you know, if handled correctly, the tuna from these methods is top quality. So it can not only support local food security, but it can also help feed uh, or help supply higher value premium markets. Um, and this is something that IPN IPNLF uh, tried to facilitate as much as possible in order to support thriving local blue economies. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. It sure did, Craig. Thank you. You even answered a bit of the question that I had. Uh, I was going to ask you next, but uh, maybe you can even touch more on it. Um, so my next question for you was, what is the monetary, societal, and environmental value of one-by-one one caught tuna, and how does this lead to ocean conservation? So you kind of already mentioned a little bit in that answer, but if you want to expand on it a little more, that would be great. Yeah, certainly. There, there, there's plenty more to say, that's for sure. So uh, the first thing to note is that one by one fishing methods are incredibly employment rich, uh, thanks to the fact that they're an active fishing method. So you need your, your hands on, you need several crew. Um, this means that on average, they employ 55 times more people per ton of tuna compared to industrialized per same fishery. Therefore, it can support many more livelihoods in coastal communities. The vessels are often locally owned, as I mentioned for the Maldives. Uh, and that means that the communities themselves are the direct beneficiaries of the money generated by the fisheries, which again, not only contributes to food security and poverty alleviation, but, but where possible, those fishers can be facilitated to get their produce to higher value premium markets, um, which can contribute to the economic prosperity of dependent coastal communities. Um, some of the fisheries like Handline are incredibly inclusive because they have a low barrier to entry. Um, they only require simple vessels and simple equipment, nothing expensive, no, no big investment needed. So it really is this simple. Catch fewer fish, look after them and earn more money. But to achieve this, we need consumers to support these one-by-one -one fisheries, to support the small scale, and, and to be honest, to stop buying from these industrialized fisheries. Uh, the simplest way you can do this, if you're gonna buy your tuna in a can, um, make sure it's 100% pole and line caught. And if you're ordering sushi, make sure your tuna is coming from rod and reel or hand line fisheries, and be prepared to pay a premium. Uh, the more consumer demand there is for these products, the more we can drive fishing towards uh, social and environmental sustainability. Uh, and finally, in my opinion, the real conservation benefit comes when we start looking at converting some of these fleets using more destructive fishing gears uh, over to one-by-one -one methods. For example, fleets using gillnet in the, Indian, in the coastal states around the Indian Ocean 
could easily convert their fleets to one by one fishing methods targeting high value, higher value species. Not only would this then be a reduction in unwanted bycatch, but it's, this would also represent an overall reduction in fishing effort, which while still economically rewarding fishers for catching fewer higher quality fish. So in my opinion, this really is a win-win scenario for conservation, for coastal states, and for critically dependent coastal communities who rely on harvesting the oceans for their livelihoods. So that is, in a nutshell, the social um, and economic benefits of one by one fishing. Perfect. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, that was a great answer. And that is definitely something I will look for in my grocery store now um, is the pull in line Perfect. fishing. Um, our last question I have from you, and um, before we move on to some audience questions, is currently you focus on tuna. Are you considering expanding, and by you I mean International Pull and Line Foundation, uh, considering expanding to work with other fish species as well, or why just tuna? Yeah, um, again, good question. So right at this moment, we are just focused on tuna. Um, but actually, it's, it's been in our plans, and it's certainly part of our plans to expand into other species in the, in the near future as part of our 2020 to 2025 strategic plan, uh, which was launched uh, middle of last year. And the way we actually planned on doing this initially was by working with the responsible tourism sector in the Maldives and um, with the small scale fishers who supply them with, with some of their seafood and looking at ways that we can incentivize fishes correctly and gain a price premium by, by doing that. Um, but unfortunately, you know, COVID-19 hit and um, had, some, had some big impacts on the tourism industry as well. So those projects are on the back burner for now, but are definitely something um, that we want to reignite in the future. And also that said, if anyone's listening and have some ideas for other low impact fisheries projects, um, don't hesitate to contact us and contact us through our social media channels um, and through our website. And if you're interested in knowing more about like what tuna you should be picking, um, choosing, we have a choose your tuna campaign on social media. So follow along and um, hopefully that'll give you some tips on, on how to support these one-by-one -one fisheries. Awesome. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, we'll definitely look into supporting some fisheries too. Um, I have a question here that I would like to ask you from Charlene Roberts. Um, Charlene, if you're listening, I did um, shorten your question a little bit, um, but it's definitely still on topic of what you asked. So Charlene recently bought yellowfin tuna and she thought it was caught by hand and lines as it is marketed as hook and line. She was shocked to discover that it was caught by long liners. So can she trust marketing terms such as hook and line and how does hook and line differ um, compared to like one by one fishing and should retailers hold the responsibility for providing customers with more information about sustainable fisheries? Yeah, right. Uh, so this is a really good question. I'm glad you asked it actually. Um, so unfortunately, hook and line is, is a like marketing terminology that can be very misleading. Um, hook and line can unfortunately include um, long lines, which we, we talked about earlier. They can be, you know, 50 kilometers in length, have 10,000 hooks, have high rates of shark, bycatch, um, and they're also frequently implicated in, in uh, human rights abuses and, and um, bonded labor at sea. So we don't want to support those fisheries. Uh, and the term hook and line is quite misleading in that sense. Uh, the one thing I would say, um, if you're buying tuna in a can, make sure it says 100% pole and line caught. If you're um, buying fish at the fish counter or, you know, a, a, pro, a vacuum packed yellowfin tuna steak, make sure it says caught by hand line or caught by rod and reel. And um, if there is any confusion or you're uncertain, I would say just don't buy that product. Um, and yes, in my opinion, it is the retailer's uh, responsibility 
to to um, make that distinction and make that clear so that consumers know what they're buying and they know that they can trust what they're buying. Thank you, Craig. Great answer to that for sure. So definitely look for some key terms such as pull in line, hand in line, rod and reel, um, which is great. And I suppose um, you can always ask your fishmonger too. And if they don't know where your fish comes from, it's probably not a good sign. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Craig. Um, we'll loop back to you hopefully at the end for some more questions and we'll move on to Jerry. Um, if you'll join us, Jerry, I can't wait to ask you about some questions about Aqua Farms organization. So to start with, yes. um, could you briefly describe some of the issues associated with most open pen aquaculture systems? and explain how Aqua Farms organization is tackling these issues to contribute to ocean stewardship? Yeah, definitely. Thank, thank you so much, Ali, um, and greetings from Tanzania to everyone. Um, so I'll just define the open, uh, aqua, open, open pen aquaculture. Sometimes we call it cage farming or uh, cage fish farming. And um, it's, a, it's a situation where you do uh, farm your fish um, in open waters, like you know, in the place where the natural water is the rearing area, and you just put your fish in a confinement. And usually, it's more fish in a small area, um, and then the natural movement of water, like waves and changes in tides, is what actually makes the uh, water exchange in the system. So, um, when this was uh, first identified as as a technology for people to get into aquaculture. Um, it created a breakthrough because um, all issues pertaining um, water quality issues that are a rare hindrance towards uh, growth of our culture were more or less um, not known. And it comes with a lot of consequences as well that, that we have to acknowledge. And um, one among the things uh, that it brings about is the issues on genetic pollution. So um, there's been a great shift of people creating hatcheries that one way or the other are supplying the replacement of the seeds that we do in our farm. And these, um, these fingerlings are used as grow out there and when they get to escape, then they, there's a chance of you know, getting polluted. And this has been seen highly in sheep farming, that's one, which is done most in the mangroves, not in the open farms, but um, also, a lot of modified organisms or sort of uh, improved strains or move, movement of fish from one country to the other to do the same type of fishing and then you put it on a natural body that that particular fish species was not, was not endemic to that place, then it ends up to be a pollution to that place. So another issue, you know, we are feeding uh, from formulated feeds which are very nutritive and that actually adds nutrients into the into the into the lake or the ocean, and I'm saying into the lake so mostly because I'm in mean, Tanzania right now. We do not have um, open pen or cage farming into the ocean, but we do have Lake Victoria, which is the second greatest uh, lake in the world, and um, it's 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 highly farmed with cage farming. Like commercial um, agriculture farms along East Africa are happening in the lake right now. And the situation, for instance, of the lake is that it's a very shallow lake, um, very high, highly nutritive. So a, a little addition of, of nutrients like that creates an oxygen environment and eventually the wild fish ends up dead. So like in the past two years, we've been having um, a number of, of, of uh, fish dies in Lake Victoria, which as a result of you know increasing nutrients in the lake, we can't say it's just from the from the fish farms, but many other anthropogenic activities, yes. But then um, there's there's a good way of going about it, and because you know at the end of the day, people need food, people need to survive, and that's what's important as well. Because what's the meaning of life if everything to us becomes inaccessible? Because um, right now in the world, among the greatest issues that are being addressed is you know. Hunger is, is one among them, um, climate change and others. So at Aqua Farms, we've been tackling these issues um, to contribute towards um, ocean stewardship 
um, in a number of ways. So the first thing we do is we uh, offer free education to farmers on being environmentally responsible. So all farmers that come into the trainings that we offer, they are taught on why they should care about where they dispose their water, for instance, if they are using pond system, but those in cage farming, especially in the leg zone, what we do is we speak to them about using quality feed that has less um, uh, del deliveries of nutrients into the into the into the lake, but also having very good um, management systems. And what do I mean by management systems? So if you have a well-trained personnel, someone very conscious on the amount of feed you put into the into the into the uh, pans or the cages, then it's obviously that very little will go into waste but if you're not using trained personnel you're not using um well formulated feeds at the end of the day it just sinks very quickly it ends up to be at the bottom of the of the lake or the ocean um one among the biggest things that is eventually happening but in so much mentioned is um entanglement of of um, other fish by the by the pens or the cages and this happens basically uh, because we supply fish feed there and it attracts fish to that place so when it attracts fish and other large predators then they end up being entangled there so what what's very important to do as a fish farmer is you know to do regular check of your nets to ensure that there are no um, areas that you know, your fish might be escaping or there are no any entanglements that are happening. That actually helps you to keep your farm very up and running and healthy, but also to ensure that you, you're conscious with what you're doing. Um, in our case, it could be very different from what's happening in the UK. Um, in UK, the salmon farms right now are, are operating at high industrial level, but the nature of the farms you have in Tanzania are very locally designed um, farms. They don't have any abilities to withstand storms and, and changes in, all, in, in the lex conditions. And that way it ends up that um, most of the infrastructures are still very, very, very local. And uh, by saying local, it, it doesn't mean that they're bad, but they need a lot of advancement. So one among the things that we do is to enhance um, um, innovations around uh, the local designs to be made more sustainable and to fit in most on best practices of production of fish. So basically that's around um, cage farming or open farming and what we do as aquifers about it. Perfect. Thank you, Jerry. You really, um, you answered my next question that I was going to ask you too. Um, which is kind of like, how do you turn an unsustainable aquaculture farm around? And you kind of mentioned it with the training and the quality feed and the monitoring of nets and the kind of innovation of design. Um, so I'm actually going to skip on to another question then we can reroute back there too. And you can combine some answers into here. But I know that you work in lakes, like you mentioned, like Victoria, and you work a lot with tilapia. Could you run us through how one of these tilapia farms kind of works, which you touched upon, upon a little bit, but also how it benefits the community it's in and how maybe it helps the community focus on more sustainable aquaculture compared to um, less sustainable uh, forms of fishing? Yes, Ali. Um, um, so one among the farms that we do run, it's actually not by the lake it's just very close to the ocean and uh, it's uh, recirculating our purchase system that we have set it's a locally designed with uh, local materials which is using less space um, and more than and even less water as well that is we're using like 90 percent less water than a regular farm that's one but also we have maximized our yield out of it what we do is you know first practice high biosecurity practices to ensure that it's very important anything that's within the farm is well confined so that nothing comes in that creates any problems. But also that way we end up reducing pollution and charges from the from the fish farm and water releases to the lakes and and the, and the surrounding bodies. So what I would say is that the technology in aquaculture is a very fast growing and and we if we look on the years at which if we look at years at which aquaculture has been happening 
all, all over the globe. It's many years, yes, we do agree, but when actually people started becoming creative, it's a very it's very few years compared to any agriculture systems, I would say. And, and that gives it an opportunity that our culture might be one of the best sustainable uh, practices that will come in the near future. And we need to give it time for innovation and technology to take part. If I connect this to CS piracy and what they mentioned about aquaculture, it being using uh, issues on on uh, you know a lot of feed that comes actually from capture fisheries and then it's being used to produce a lot of uh, fish feed and back then it goes again to the fish farm and then we produce it for the fish. It's actually yes that has been happening but it's already known and a lot of people are working around single cell proteins and alternative plant-based proteins that can actually serve that purpose here in tanzania right now we have um, people running insects uh, protein uh, businesses that are actually supplementing not just fish farms but even uh, chicken farms or poultry farms so it's, it's very important to give a room for aquaculture to show that there is an opportunity for this to be a very sustainable um, climate sensitive way of generating foods and livelihood for people so so it's very it's very important to do that so this form of ours that i mentioned earlier which is a recirculating system we are centering it around that and even right now we're looking forward to install a solar a system that will be generating sustainable energy within the farm and that way will be 100% running sustainably. I can't say 100% but at least to an extent that is, is more accept acceptable. And um, a very important question that you ask is how does it benefit the community? So first of all it's being used as a demo farm so a lot of people come and learn from our farm to, to, to so that they can set for, set up farms like that. That's one. But two, most of our products are sold out just, um, at a reduced price to the communities around us. And this is because in Tanzania yet our culture is a very young thing. Um, if you cannot believe, but it it contributes only to one percent of the total capture fisheries of the country, which is is very minimal compared to anywhere in the world. Um, which it gives us an opportunity to utilize the resources we have. So Tanzania is blessed with a lot of resources that can foster aquaculture, but then the difficulties of technology, people understanding systems and then technical know-how of doing aquaculture is the chart. So, so our farm being used as a demo farm for people to learn on how they could practice uh, sustainable fish farming, then that's, that's a social impact that we are, we are, we are creating in our communities. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Jerry. So um, just to simplify, again, I think you're talking about like recirculating aquaculture systems, right? Like a closed system, a like land-based system, which is really neat kind of demo farms for the communities. So, I mean, that's like super environmentally yes. um, beneficial. Um, so I guess my last question for you is how do you balance environmental protection, so getting farms to kind of switch to these closed systems, and the need for local communities to have this economic and food security? So you kind of already mentioned like the fish is sold to surrounding communities for a lower cost. So what kind of pushes the communities to go for the more sustainable option? Yeah, so we, well, the first thing that we do is actually creating the uh, agency you know uh, many people in our community yes they want they, that the reasons of doing aquaculture is actually either to make fish for their home like you know just subsistence use but others are doing it to generate income so creating a sense of agency on environmental sensitive aquaculture it's, it's still a huge challenge i can say but then if you put a, a possibility of them creating enough yield and return from that then there's there's that um, acceptance. So what we do is, um, if we have new setups and things like that, we invite communities to to work with us and understand, you know, why are we putting a septic tank? Why are we putting this? Why are we putting that? And that creates a point of, oh, okay, so this is how it's done, and then that way they end up. But another thing which is very important that um, we are trying to ensure that these environmental protection and the needs are, are met is that most of what we do, we usually link, link it to direct benefits. We brainstorm with the communities on alternatives ways in which they can generate income, um, because that's, that's, we're working with communities that are 
you know, working on a daily basis to generate money to survive on that particular day. So you cannot tell that person, um, you know, if you do this in 50 years, this will happen. No, what they want is they want food on the table. So creating alternative livelihoods, support systems that one way or the other give opportunity for them to generate income, then they, they tune into systems. I could, I, could good, I could give a very simple example of um, people who are practicing uh, fish farming by the river that flows to the Indian Ocean. And what they do exactly is they divert the water from the river and at the end of the day, the volume of, of water that reaches the ocean is actually very reduced leading to erosion that happens in the ocean. So at the end of the day, coastal erosion is affecting the, the communities that the lower part, but people up, up, up hill are benefiting from the fish farming. But then telling them that this erosion is affecting the coastal communities that are living by the by the by the ocean, it's, it will just come up to you because salt intrusion will come, and then these farms of yours will not be uh, reliable. So that is a first way for them to say, uh huh. But then, what alternative are you creating for them so that um, they can shift from their normal way of doing to the new way of doing? So I would argue. Um, even for Craig, um, who is actually pushing for people to practice um, um, the sustainable fishing methods that are not at commercial scale, it's very important to ensure that the, the urgency and the needs of that particular community are immediately addressed for them to easily accept that thing. So creating the urgency, readiness, and willingness of that particular community to accept that environmental protection is very important is just by creating a way to, for them to make a return or an immediate return out of it yeah that's that's for me but i would like to conclude um with a, a, a just a sentence um since his piracy talked about world, world pressing issues of food security um on a one-sided coin I do understand a lot of things around fisheries have, have, have a lot of issues, but then it's very important for the story to capture the other side of the, of the coin, which I think it did not capture. The issues around growing populations and what we should eat, the issues around um, land use and water use and how uh, both um, animal and plant-based proteins can, can be collided to create the sustainable systems that we are speaking. So the movements that are done by different other agencies to create that um, sustainability, they shouldn't be taken for granted because it's a lot of effort and one way or the other, the cease piracy might be misleading people to assume that everything is a is a false thing. That's, that's my perspective, my personal perspective about it. So it's very important to look at the story on two sides about it and not just concluding that we should shift from eating fish to other things thank you thank you jerry those were some uh great insights and i really like how you kind of nailed home that it is most important to kind of get the communities kind of an instant return for them to be able to want to support um ecological fish farms and i think that's a lot of people um, a lot of things that people overlook um, with the with the kind of the privilege of being able to choose which fish you can eat. Um, so that's great work you're doing and thank you so much. I have one question that I'm hoping you can answer because I know you do a little bit of work about like on seafood. Um, this is a question from one of our audience members. And if you don't know it, maybe you can just touch a little bit on the seaweeds. Um, but have you heard about 3D ocean farming? And to my understanding, 3D ocean farming is related a lot to seaweeds. But um, if you have heard about it, what are your thoughts on it, Jerry? Um, I assume it's a sort of an integration in one community. That's of what I what I think. But um, I've, I've I didn't I've not heard of that community, but it's. something I'm happy to learn about it. Okay, perfect, yeah. Um, I think seaweed farming is great too. So uh, we definitely don't have um, time to go too much into seaweed farming, but I guess one other question we have from an audience is, 
do you think it's better to buy a wild fish or a farmed fish if you had the choice and if you could buy a sustainably farmed fish versus a wild fish? I would go for farmed fish um, because there is so much unknown about what's outside there, but you know, something farmed in a controlled environment, you can trace where it came from um, and you know, fed with things that are you know, sustainable like you know the, the alternative proteins that i'm saying then i think it's it's the best way to go around and if the world can be conscious about that then there's a lot of pressure that can be removed from the capture fisheries which is actually the commercial fleets that are are, are detrimental so so i will go for a fun fish perfect thank you jerry now i see rachel you raised your hand did you want to jump in there as well yeah, I'd love to if I could grab a second. So um, it's a really good question and it's a great answer, Jerry, as well. I know from our perspective, we've been doing a lot of work at OceanWise and encouraging people to eat what we call restorative seafood. And a lot of that seafood, if not all of that seafood is farmed. And that's all things that are like low on the trophic level, meaning they're low on the food chain. So things that you don't have to provide food to, in addition to other sustainably produced aquaculture. So if you think about like oysters, mussels, clams, seaweed, you can farm those things in a way that you're, you do have ecosystem impacts because you are introducing something to the water, but at the same time, you're not providing any food to it. And a lot of those species can actually clean the water around them. So through their act of taking in little bits of things that float by that are food, um, shellfish can clean the water and um, by being present in the water as well, uh, seaweeds and those like hanging baskets of shellfish can actually provide habitat for baby fish to hide in. So there are ways that you can eat seafood that can be incredibly sustainable that that's that's farmed in addition to the really amazing sustainable work that Jerry's talking about. And I just wanted to say as well, like it's everything in moderation, right? We, a lot of us have the incredible privilege that we can choose what we're going to eat. And I think you can, you can choose to support really sustainable aquaculture and that's amazing and you should. But I think it's also, as Craig was getting to, it's really important to support the local fishers in your community and around the world that are doing the right thing because you want to ensure that those people are able to continue to have the livelihood that's supporting environmental sustainability and in supporting their community. So I think, you know, spread spread your love around, make sure that you purchase sustainable aquaculture and some sustainable wild capture as well. Um, one other thing is the global population is continuing to increase. More than 50% of the seafood that is coming out of the oceans, lakes, rivers, everything is now coming from aquaculture. And if people want to keep eating seafood, more and more of that is to be coming from sustainable aquaculture. We find in Canada specifically, we have a lot of open net pen farming that Farming tends to be a dirty word in Canada, but it really shouldn't be, and people need to support those sustainable choices. Perfect. Thank you, Rachel. That's a great addition um, as well to kind of, yeah, to not just kind of turn away from farming, that there is a lot of sustainable farming, such as what Jerry mentioned as well, um, which is great. Um, I would now like to briefly touch on a topic that we haven't quite discussed, and it's kind of a new innovative topic here in fisheries, and I'm going to call in Rebecca to give us a brief demo, or not demo, a brief um, <laughs> summary of what cell-based fisheries are. Yeah, so um, we were going to have a panelist um, talk about this today. Um, so I'm no, by no means an expert on lab-grown fish, um, but there is a lot of work and developments being done um, in the lab grown kind of fish meat um, industry. Um, as far as we're aware, nothing's actually on the market yet, um, but basically how this works is um, a small piece of muscle cell is taken from either like a fish or a crustacean, um, so fish and shellfish. It's then grown in a lab um, similar to how kind of um, plant-based, uh, sorry, not plant-based, uh, lab-based meats are grown. Um, and then it development is being done to make sure that it has the same kind of taste and texture as wild fish meat. Um, so there are some benefits. Obviously, you're not contributing to overfishing. Um, the meat itself doesn't have things like mercury pollution, which is sometimes an issue with um, larger kind of um, protein, like, bigger fish that are higher up the, the um, food chain. Um, so 
there's there's that and there's also some plant-based alternatives that are available um which are you know getting more and more popular um so things like seitan um soy tapioca starch also um and mushroom protein um and some other options as well so i would like to ask um all the panelists um what your kind of opinions are on these um lab-based and plant-based solutions um and whether you would try um either or both of them uh let's start with craig uh yeah so i think i would try a lot of the plant-based solutions for sure um although i'm a bit skeptical of some like of the meat substitutes because it's not clear like what's in them and whether they're actually healthy for you even though they're like trying to imitate uh, meat the cell-based ones i'd like to know more about the the um, nutrition and health implications before i would dive in and eat them is is my answer short and sweet fair enough yes i think i think that goes for anything that we're eating you know we need a lot of information about um where it's coming from how it's produced and that goes for kind of farmed and wild caught fish as well um rachel would you like to go next yeah sure um I would, I would eventually be open to trying both. I think the, the plant-based solutions would probably be similar to Craig, my, my first go-to just because there's, there's more of a, an international history of making fun and delicious substitutes for, for um, animal protein uh, in, a, in a vegan way. So things like, you know, seitan and all that good stuff. Um, that said, like the lab-based protein, I would, I would give it a try. It would just be really important to me. Like, like Craig said, just the same way as like knowing where your, your seafood coming from an animal or a plant comes from knowing what all of the things that are making up the food that I'm eating are, is important to me as well, but I wouldn't discount it for sure. Awesome. Thank you. And Jerry, what's, what's your opinion? Um, I'm, I'm very, I'm very sensitive on what to take on my plate and I think, I think I will have to, but I think what they are trying to do is something good, but um, I'm just, you know, reluctant on testing. So a lot of reluctance to, to try it perhaps and see how it is. Um, I would definitely be curious to try it and um, kind of see what it can be made into and its placements there. I mean, the the options are endless and from your fish sticks to your fillets to sushimi. I'm uh, very curious um, what it's gonna turn out to be. And I know a lot of it is currently in the, what are they calling the taste testing phase? Um, so I guess we'll see what happens there. Um, going back quickly to close it up, um, what is everyone's open it up now to a non lab growing cell based seafood? Does everyone have a favorite sustainable seafood dish that they like to eat? And I am also looking for recipe innovations and ideas here. Um, I'm definitely a big fan of a clam linguine with some kelp salt on it. Um, Craig, do you have a favorite dish? Uh, yeah, and I promise I'm not just saying this because I work for the International Pond and Line Foundation, but it's got to be um, sashimi yellowfin tuna, obviously caught by either hand line or rod and reel or trolling. And uh, with a big dollop of wasabi, uh, some soy sauce, and to, to zazz it up a little bit, a bit of sesame oil. Ooh, nice. That sounds really good. Rachel, what about you? Yeah, I will, I will send a couple of links for you to, to, to pop uh, out to people. Our website actually has a recipe section um, because we have partnerships with different chefs and different restaurants. We have been able to do a lot of like demos and other things, which is really great because especially in, in, you know, US, Canada, people are very restrictive in what seafood they want to try. You know, you got your, your fish sticks, you got your tuna cans. Um, and we're always trying to get people to encourage them to try things that might be lower on the food chain that might be different than what they've tried before. Um, some of my favorites is, is literally anything grilled with like a Japanese ponzu sauce um, or, and you know, from my, my visit to uh, the Southern US, um, shrimp and grits is really good. 
like some good, like sustainable, like big shrimp with, with, you know, essentially like a polenta corn with some, uh, some cheese in it with garlic. It's delicious. Um, we also put out a cookbook recently, which is uh, a fundraiser for a program called Cooking for Conservation. And I'll, I'll post you the link for that as well. It's all restorative species. So all the clams, um, some other shellfish and some really cool kelp recipes as well. If, you know, it is a for purchase thing, but if people are curious about expanding their palates a bit, it could be something that people might find fun, especially in this lovely pandemic world and everybody's doing fun cooking at home. Great. Thank you, Rachel. What about you, Jerry, a favorite seafood dish that you have? Yeah, so um, my favorite seafood, I don't know if you guys know it, but in Swahili we call it changu. It's a, it's a group of fish. Um, when it's grilled, it's, uh, it's very nice and some lamb. But something interesting is that recently I've, get, I've developed a lot of interest with uh, foods that are including seaweed in it, and especially the seaweed that we have here in Tanzania, which has been awesome. So some salad from, from seaweed and, and a smoothie will do me great, and that's great. Actually, um, I just started a virtual cafe. It's called uh, Healthy Wheat Cafe, that is promoting the usage of, of you know local um, seaweed as part of our daily meals. And I think there's a lot I can learn from Ocean Wise. Perfect. Thanks. Wow. Well, um, you guys definitely made me kind of hungry. I'm in Western Canada too, so it's getting to lunchtime soon for me. Um, so I might have to look at some of your uh, cookbooks and suggestions there. Um, I would like to thank you all so much for joining our Fisheries Innovations and Solution webinar. I really hope that um, people, our audience, learned a lot from this. Um, once again, feel free to shoot me an email um, at media at the marine diaries.com with any questions, and I can always pass them along to our awesome panelists. Don't forget to follow our panelists on social media as well. So that's Aqua Farms Organization, the International Pull and Line Foundation, and OceanWise and OceanWise Seafood. Um, as well as follow along with us at the Marine Diaries on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook for your daily marine bio fix. You'll always find some uh, great new topics there. We have coming up a um, fisheries campaign this year too, so stay tuned for that, as well as for more webinars in our series. We will post a recording as well um, as some of the questions that we have answered with this webinar up on our website um, within the next week or so as well for everyone to rewatch it and share it around with your friends. As to support fisheries, I think a big part is going to be education and kind of pushing people to make the correct choices um, in what we do. So thank you all for joining and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening and thanks to the panelists. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you.